So thank you very much for the friendly introduction and thank you for having me here on this great panel. So um, I, I will tell you who is here. Uh, on the very left, uh, you see uh, Julia Friedlander. She is a CEO of Atlantic Brücke and a senior fellow of the Atlantic Council and they're the head of Economic Statecraft Initiative. And then in the middle you see uh, Carla Nolov. She's a senior fellow of Atlantic Council and a professor of political science at the University of Toronto. And her research is, is focused on international cooperation and on, on uh, big powers and on the uh, relationship of power and money, to, to make it short. And here on my left is uh, Dalip Singh, a former deputy national, national security advisor, member of National Security Council under the Biden administration. And uh, as far as I know, he was really involved in, in, uh, in these new sanctions on, on Russia in, in uh, the de development and the design of that. So, um, yes, uh, in August, uh, The Economist asked uh, on, on the front page, uh, do sanctions really work? And I think that's something we, we are all are asking, still asking, and I think we come to that a little bit later. But for the beginning, I, I would uh, think that uh, Carla would present her new research paper, uh, which is exactly about the relationship of power and money, or as I understand, of uh, military power and currency. So, uh, yes, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very happy uh, to be here. There's uh, no place I'd rather be except for in my bed because I'm nursing a cold uh, for a bit. So I hope that I do not get a cough attack um, as we proceed. I, I'll, I'll keep my comments uh, about my paper relatively brief. And, and I think it's helpful, first of all, to you know, go through what it means to be an international currency. And an international currency is really a currency that's used outside the borders of the um, uh, of the state issuing the currency. And um, a currency is national money uh, issued by governments or a coalition of governments uh, such as the euro. And then we kind of come to, like, what is money? And for economists, it's very simple. It's a medium of exchange. It's a unit of account. It's a store of value. And, um, of course, it takes on those roles then internationally, both for governments and also for private actors. Uh, but there are other dimensions of money, and if we unpack even what the economic definition means, there's, you know, there's uh, money as, as uh, uh, freedom of double coincidence of wants, um, freedom from barter. Um, there's money as memory. Uh, money can be power, prestige. And of course, today we see money very much as a tool of coercion. And it's very interesting to me that this kind of brings in a geopolitical dimension that we've talked a lot about in political economy all the way kind of back to the 1970s where there was you know, always this understanding that um, a country that was going to be issuing an international currency was going to have certain features. And so the primary determinants are economic. Um, you know, the size of one's commerce, the size of one's economy, the size of one's financial markets, and then things like price stability. Um, you also don't want the external value of, of the currency do, to be um, decreasing too much. Um, and then there, there was this understanding also that geopolitical factors mattered. And uh, the way that it mattered was that the United States extended security uh, guarantees to allies, particularly in Europe, and they kind of subsidized the dollar econ economically. They supported the dollar as a result. I and mean, that was an understanding that a lot of people had. And that the confidence that we had in the dollar was partly a function of these economic attributes, but was also a function of the military might of the United States. So the dollar was not only backed by those market characteristics, but also the full force of uh, the United States military apparatus in the sense that it, could, it was very well equipped to defend its borders. When we think about the security guarantees, of course, this you know, could be interpreted as 
uh, a way uh, for the United States to guarantee that those states were free from coercion by other states. And now we kind of see that logic turned upside down, where um, uh, money is, is becoming um, this uh, instrument uh, for coercion to get other uh, countries to pursue policy preferences that are more aligned with the United States, a particular understanding of international order. And so the risk, of course, then, is that countries who do not wish to do so um, will not trust in the dollars, will not be so confident in their ability to use dollars, and they will shy away from using the dollar. They will try to find alternative arrangements. And this has been in conversation, I think, for a very long time, but we're actually now seeing real steps, um, meaningful steps, towards um, diversification away from the dollar and, to some extent, towards, uh, uh, away from the euro. This is very difficult to quantify because we only have very partial data over who holds what. And so based on a limited sample of countries, of both allies and non-aligned countries, um, we performed this analysis uh, for, the, for the Atlantic Council. And it, it turns out that there's not much diversification. Again, I, I want to be careful and kind of um, you know, selling these results. Uh, based on this sample, um, there is quite limited diversification. You know, there's, there's almost no diversification, essentially, away from, from the dollar. There was more diversification prior to the war, actually, right? And for the euro as well, there's not very much. Uh, there's actually, I think, um, an increase, uh, so, somewhat of an increase uh, in, in, in euro holdings. Um, and there is diversification into the Chinese uh, RMB, but there was more diversification into the RMB prior to the war. And so I, I do, however, think that it is important to track these um, fundamental changes in the way that countries are seeking to find alternative bilateral, often these are bilateral agreements, um, which of course don't then imply that there's going to be the rise of the RMB as an international currency, because in that bilateral trade, they're using the RMB. Uh, and, and, and in order for the RMB to take on a more prominent role, they'd have to use a third currency. Um, there are also technological changes that, that feed into uh, this phenomena. Uh, for instance, the um, launch of the dig digital uh, RMB um, could make this process accelerate. Right, because we would see a more, uh, you know, an ex an ex a faster move towards a convertible RMB, right, um, and and that would then increase the attractiveness of also pricing and settling in in, R in RMB, and then I think there is also, um, you know, something that I actually have not paid a lot of attention to uh, previously, but also. Uh, private stable coins, right? But like pri privately issued stable coins. And I, I think that a lot of academics kind of, I mean, at least for political scientists, they kind of dismiss this as uh, quite irrelevant. I mean, kind of almost like cryptocurrencies, right? I mean, okay, so... But, but there, is, there is a prospect of uh, disintermediating the dollar if, you know, if, if, if you... Um, in, in foreign exchange markets, uh, if we see more use of, of, of stable coins, because you can actually then exchange currencies directly. And of course, one of the roles of the dollar, at least in, in currency markets, is as a vehicle currency, 
right? So a lot of currencies are traded via the dollar. And, and that role would then be um, undone uh, or partially undone or significantly reduced um, if, if it were much cheaper to trade bilateral uh, currencies, the currency pairs against each other. So I look very much forward to uh, getting comments and questions. I don't know about the questions, but comments um, <laughs> uh, on, on my paper and, um, and to uh, talk more about the topics that, you know, Frank also yeah. presaged in terms of like, where economic statecraft is going um, and if it's effective. Right. Yeah. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, uh, those were lots of thoughts. So, uh, of course, I have a question, but maybe Julia and, and, and you, Dalip, you have some comments before. Maybe, Julia, may you start and do you have comments or special questions for, for Carla? No, I mean, I think, um, thank you so much. And Carla and I have been talking about a lot of these issues for um, a really long time. And I think we can go into, I think, Frank, we discussed what is, what is economic statecraft. We've been sort of throwing around that term for you guys over the course of the day without giving you a definition or at least how we have come to define it. Um, I think what, to start out, um, referring back to Carla's paper, is this concept of the use of finance as a determinant of and regulation and economics as a determinant of the balance of power between nations, right? Um, I think we tend to we tend to still think um, about um, about these terms in military ways, right? Um, looking at the course of the the twentieth and early you know even the twenty first century, we're thinking about the terms of borders. Um, and, and how um, nation states define themselves. Um, but I think what is so interesting about Carla's research is that you bring in this aspect of what you term great power competition. I actually would argue with you about, about whether this is a, wh whether we're seeing a reemergence of great power competition in that, and the relationship between that and the deployment of elements of our, um, of our global system that we've sort of tried to pretend are above nation states. We've tried to pretend that currencies are fungible, that markets are fungible, that, mar that, um, that markets are open. And what we're learning more is that these, uh, that the restrictions of, of, the, of access to international finance, to export markets, to, to, to credit markets, are, um, are more and more the determinants of how we think about how nations and peoples and economies position themselves against each other. So that's sort of, that would be sort of my reflection um, on your paper, but I turn to Dalip. Sure. Um, yeah. And thanks, Carla, for the thought-provoking paper, and thanks, Julia, for your comments, and Frank, for moderating this discussion. I have a number of reactions to the paper. Let me start with where I, where I agree. Uh, I agree with the point that's made in the paper that we are seeing uh, greater frequency of the use of economic statecraft and higher potency than, than we've ever seen before. And I think that is symptomatic of an era of intensified great power competition among nuclear powers. So set against the alternative of direct military conflict or doing nothing uh, when there's aggression that's taking place, economic statecraft will be increasingly appealing. I also agree that some of the tools of economic statecraft, not all, uh, subordinate economic interests for geopolitical goals. I say some because there are many underappreciated tools of economic statecraft in which uh, there's, a, there's a mutual reinforcement of economic objectives and geopolitical goals. For example, infrastructure finance, debt relief, loan guarantees, bilateral aid, support through the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, there, the economic and geopolitical goals can be reinforcing. Uh, the third area in which I agree is the conclusion, at least what I interpreted to be your conclusion, which is that we're not headed for a post-dollar world anytime soon. Mm -hmm. And I very much agree with that, but I think every U.S. policymaker uh, should never take that for granted, and we don't. Uh, I'm no longer a U.S. policymaker, by the way. Uh, you know... I, in this environment of intensified great power competition, the incentives to hedge against the dollar-based financial system have risen. And so we have to continually invest in the conditions that gave the dollar primacy in the first place. Mm -hmm. Strong and independent institutions, uh, rule of law, uh, an open system for trade and capital and people, a story that attracts ideas and talent and goodwill, and trust 
that we're going to use these tools, these very powerful tools, as careful financial stewards. Um, let me just say one area where I disagreed with the paper, and maybe it was just semantics. But in the paper, it said the U.S. is using some of these tools of economic statecraft. I think the line was uh, uh, as a as a form of financial retribution because of policy divergence. And the way I think of policy divergence is when policies are moving in a different direction, but you share the same objectives or framework. Like for example, when central banks Sometimes one central bank is raising interest rates, another central bank is is decreasing them.、Um, the policies are moving in different directions, but they both may share the same mandate for price stability. I think in this case it's something quite different. We're talking about, in the case of Russia,、mm -hmm. a rapacious and barbaric invasion that's terrorizing 45 million innocent people.、Uh, it's violating core principles that underpin global peace and security, and that lie at the heart of the UN Charter. And so,、uh, to me, this is not about policy divergence.、Uh, this is about a, a very different worldview、uh, that, that threatens the most dear principles that have given us decades of, of relative peace. And it's not about retribution either. It's not about vengeance. The purpose of these sanctions with Russia was really to change Putin's calculus by imposing the most severe economic costs at our disposal and by providing a demonstration effect for any other dictator or autocrat. That wants to draw his own sphere of influence by the barrel of a gun or by coercive measures. So, thanks again for the paper. So that leads to my my first question, a very simple question with a very complicated answer. I think maybe you just continue on that. Are the sanctions working? The sanctions against Russia. Do you see what you wanted to see when you set it up? So the first point I would make is that sanctions were never intended as a standalone solution. They're they're meant to be embedded in a broader strategy that has a number of different elements. One is to provide、uh, as much support as Ukraine needs to defend itself and to fight for its own freedom. The U.S. has provided over 15 billion dollars in that regard.、Uh, it's also about providing humanitarian support for the over 10 million refugees and displaced people that are pouring into Europe.、Uh, it's about helping the world deal with the spillovers of Putin's invasion、uh, in, in food, in the quantity of food and the price of food. And the price of energy, the quantity of energy.、Uh, it's about helping Europe and other consumers of Russian energy diversify as fast as they can. That is taking place. It's also about fortifying NATO's eastern flank and enlarging NATO.、Mm -hmm. And we've seen a sea change in in the in the support for what the West, broadly speaking, is trying to accomplish. Now, as it relates to sanctions、uh, in particular, yes, I think the impacts that we're seeing. Are broadly in line with what we warned Putin would happen if he if he prosecuted this invasion.、Uh, the the GDP contraction in Russia this year and next, if you look at the IMF's forecasts, they're not as large as what I thought at the outset of the invasion, but they'll probably、uh, amount to at least double digits. That's about double what we saw in terms of Russia's contraction after its default in 1998. Unlike then. When Russia was getting integrated into the global economy, now it's getting isolated as a pariah state.、Uh, inflation touched 17 percent in Russia. The central bank of Russia had to raise its policy rate to 20 percent. That combination of very high inflation, very high interest rates, will really damage Russia's long-term growth prospects. So will the exit of more than 1,000 private sector companies,、uh, more than 500,000 of Russia's best and brightest. Many of them in the most productive sectors of the economy.、Uh, Russia's imports since February are down more than 50 percent. That's impacting Putin's ability to、uh, to sustain the military effort, but also to modernize and diversify his economy. You've likely heard stories about Russia running out of precision-guided missiles because it can't access Western microchips. Its tank、uh, factories are, are are shutting down because they lack Western components. Most of the air fleet in Russia, the commercial air fleet, is grounded. I could go on and on, but we have we have severed some of the most critical inputs to to Russia's military-industrial complex. At a very personal level, the reality in Russia is very tragic, and that that needs to be said.、Uh, it's getting harder for Russians to travel abroad. Some can't use their debit cards.、Uh, many will have to eventually resort to buying knockoff clothes or or, or, or cars. Uh, and and all of that is a is a very sad consequence of this needless and reckless war. Okay,、uh, 
Julia, maybe you have some comments on that. So we, we see, of course, that sanctions work in some way, but do they work in the way that they change, really change what Putin is doing? So I think that that's the next question. And, and what, what do you see there or what do you expect what could happen? Mm -hmm. I think what this crisis has shown us is that there is a, you cannot, um, it becomes increasingly hard to align the, the time frame for financial, economic, and regulatory mechanisms with that of a hot war on the ground. So if we started out, and you know, again, I'm not going to, um, Philippe was personally doing this, but from the outside, what I saw was, um, an overestimation of the capacity of Russia and an underestimation of the capacity of Ukraine, mm -hmm. leading us to believe that Ukraine could fall within days, to saying we actually have to find an equivalent <coughs> of, of, of a, of a on-scale invasion to, a, in financial means as a, as a counter, right? So you go all the way to the top of that escalation ladder, which was the blocking of access to, the, to, um, to foreign exchange reserves. But it turned out that we were actually too, a little bit too good at our game for that calculus. And then we moved into a different phase, which was, well, actually we're in an extended version of the 2014 scenario where this could go on for 10 years, fighting back across the front mm -hmm. and looking at the duration of sanctions and how they could over time degrade uh, Russia's ability to pay for things and to, and to get them writ large, right? So financial sanctions and export controls. And now we're in a different strategic phase where we're saying, well, actually, this could actually end up reflecting more of what we, we would like in the first place, an outcome where, which might lead to negotiations, which could even lead to something that Ukraine could, send, could consider to be a victory. So sanctions are, um, have a time lag, and we can, I can, I'll talk a little bit more about how, how we consider that, but that you have to consider that we have been trying to use these mechanisms in the timeline of a, mil a direct military conflict. And there's sort of a, a, a disconnect there in how we can make that work. Um, again, we have, we have assigned um, sanctions an incredible role that um, I think that we, it, over time, okay? So in the post sort of 9-11 era, in the, in, the, in the Patriot Act era, we really, I mean, sanctions were there to block um, access to m funds that were gonna help people blow things up, right? It was counterterrorism financing. So can we actually physically prevent a terrorist act because the financing art isn't there to pay for explosive devices? Okay? And so that was a very sort of transactional way of thinking about it. And over, and over the past couple of decades, we've expanded this to try to tackle any, any political conflict that we see across the world. And so in, in many ways, right? So whether it's looking at trying to you know, hold human rights violators to account and try to take their money away to, again, trying to pressure Maduro out of office. One of the most, of course, storied examples is, of course, bringing Iran back to the negotiating table over, over the nuclear negotiations that we've moved increasingly away from something tactile, right? Here, your money has now, is now gone to, where, to a political objective where then you then have um, and f you have diplomats and foreign policy experts saying, we're going to do something about this. We're going to have sanctions and we're going to hold them to account. Now, I know this phrase, hold to account. To me, it says it's, 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 it's a stand in for, for having an actual strategy of what to do about it. Right? We're going to hold them <laughs> to account. We're going to show them that we're mad versus saying you're no longer going to be able to carry out X, Y, Z activity that we deem to be. You are not right. allowed to win. That's a, that's a phrase like that. You are not allowed to win. What does that mean? Right. No, but then, I mean, again, like, I mean, think when I, um, when I, when I was, um, we, we were, you know, you create these axes of resistance, you know, yeah. and it's not, and again, we, I mean, not, not on the scale of necessarily what Carl has been alluding to, right? But that you, your, your, the success of your policy ultimately hangs on, um, um, is so easily broken by, by the smallest violation. So, you know, if we're pr putting pressure on Iran at the same time as we're putting pressure on Venezuela, 
mm. the same time as we're putting pressure on Russia, right? Like they're all going to try to find like axes of efficiency to carry out the daily business that they have to in order to support their economies. It's not even, you know, as out of out of some sort of, you know, w desire to counter the United States. It's like this is how we're going to have to function because we've been blocked from from transacting in mm. the dollar system. So my, you know, my favorite example of this is when you know, it was, was Venezuela when we noticed that the Russians were delivering little green men, that the Chinese were considering issuing credit, the Cubans were providing, Cubans were providing medical expertise and, 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 and thugs, essentially, to help protect, protect Maduro. And then you had the Iranians shipping crude over in international waters, <laughs> right? And we had nothing to, and we had exhausted all of our means to stop that. Right, and so that was sort of a the the exhaustion of our um, of our political will against the financial mechanisms that we actually had to tackle it. Carla, if if we look into back into history, I've done it only a little bit. So I think we, we see very mixed uh, uh, experiences from from the twenties, maybe uh, before Second World War. There was the idea that sanctions could be the right thing to do, so the, that you wouldn't have to have Uh, any more war, things like that, and it, it didn't work out that way. So uh, if we look a, a little bit in other cases and a little bit back in history, um, what do you think, uh, in general, what kind of condition uh, do we need to be successful with sanctions? Maybe you can elaborate that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, you know, I think there's a lot of questioning uh, you know of the efficacy of, of, of sanctions whether whether sanctions really work and most people or you know a, a large body of scholars come to the conclusion that they really do not work and I I think that you know it really depends on how one characterizes success you know what what, what counts as a success um, There, there, you know, there's there are several kind of depositories over sanctions episodes uh, since you know the 1950s, and and the the way that that success is kind of um, uh, evaluated um, is you know it, it can be a partial success. Does it have to be a total success? What about compromise solutions? Um, and I think it really depends on kind of the policy goal, right? I mean, I think it's very difficult to try to get a country to change its policy once it's already embarked upon a path. You know, it's, it's very because of audience costs um, it, and because of national pride. I think it's very, very difficult to get that policy change. And so if we're talking about things like preventing war, um, you know, ending war, um, where there's already kind of been a, a, a public commitment, I think that's very difficult. But we're looking at other things like um, democracy promotion, right? I mean, uh, th I think that the, su the success record there has been a lot higher. Um, and then I also think it really depends on who you're trying to deter, um, deterring a great power is always going to be extremely difficult. Deterring a great power that's um, hell bent on, you know, that's on a war path uh, is going to be exceedingly difficult. Is Russia a great power? That's a question now. Yes, I think I would characterize it as a great <laughs> power. I mean, before the war, at least. Right? So, yeah. Yeah. Can I can I jump in on this? Sure. Yeah. sure. I mean, I, I so three thoughts. You're free to show <laughs> job in if one, one is when, when I see studies of whether sanctions work, I mean, the problem with many of these studies is they don't consider the counterfactual. Mm -hmm. So when you're dealing with a situation in which mm -hmm. there's a violation of core international principles, mm -hmm. you typically have three choices. A, you can do nothing. Uh, and if you do nothing in the face of unchecked aggression, uh, that has direct costs. It also has indirect costs because you're sending a signal to any other dictator or autocrat that this type of aggression will not be met with mm -hmm. equal or greater force. That has uncertainties and, and a chilling effect associated with that path. Second option is direct military conflict. Third option is the entire spectrum of economic statecraft that we're talking about. So many of the analyses don't actually consider sanctions mm -hmm. in the context of the alternatives. Second is I think we have learned a lot of things from history about the kinds of principles that make sanctions more effective. Um, one is they should be used sparingly. When principles that underpin global peace and security 
are at risk. Certainly that's the case with the invasion of Ukraine, no question about it. Mm. Uh, they should be responsible to limit unwanted spillovers in the target country and also the global economy. Uh, they should be calibrated so that the chance of coordinating with allies and partners is, uh, is maximized, both because that multiplies the direct impact, but also because it gives a signal this is not a unilateral exercise of power, it's a shared defense of, of, of core principles. The sanctions should be flexible, so you can ratchet them higher or lower depending upon how the target responds. And they need to be sustainable because they take time to work. I think we could talk about Iran in this context, and we could talk about Russia 2014, but in Iran, this was a very patient sanctions program that started, you know, uh, more than seven years before the JCPOA was signed. Hmm. First, it involved the U.S. targeting more than 100 uh, entities in Iran that were supporting the nuclear program. And this is a very, by the way, these sanctions had a very targeted objective to stop Iran from developing a nuclear bomb. Then we had four U.N. resolutions that codified the objective in, in Iran. Uh, and then there was, there was staying power until Iran came to the negotiating table. And as a consequence of the JCPOA, Iran lost 98% of its enriched uranium. It shut down a heavy water nuclear reactor. And you had IEA inspectors that had the right to inspect any facility where they suspected cheating. Okay, so they went from two to three months away from developing a nuclear bomb to having no pathway to developing a nuclear bomb. Now that they're out of the deal, they're back to within weeks of a nuclear breakout. So that, I think Iran is, is, a, is an example that should be studied more carefully, particularly in the current context. And I think this episode, too, with time, we'll be able to judge what would have happened had we not responded as forcefully as we did. Julia, it seems you have some no, I mean, I, additional I agree, remarks, I, with, I think. No, I, like, I agree with Dilip, right? I mean, I, I, express, I express a lot of skepticism sometimes about the tempo and the, I think ultimately about the rhetoric that we assign to the, the ability of these measures to act within the time frames that we would like them to. But if you look, um, um, but if you look at, at what, we ha- what we have collectively, the G7 plus essentially has done to Russia over the past um, couple of months, right? You have taken the 11th largest economy in the world, um, and you have made it so that they essentially they are uncreditable uh, in, internationally. Um, that their domestic production, again, as Dalipa said, has, has, has ground to a halt. And you will see, I mean, I, I do believe over time that even if sanctions went away tomorrow, what international investors would go back and say that we want, we want to reopen our plants. We want, <laughs> we, want to, we, want to, we want to provide a lot of credit. We want to move back in, right? And so you have... Um, ultimately through financial means and through export control means denied uh, denied a, an actor the ability to perpetrate a war now of course that doesn't mean that the, the material that is currently there is exhausted yet mm. but i i i have a firm belief that we will look back in time and say that these international efforts will have shortened russia's ability um and certainly that the the forcefulness with which they were able to were able to act so um, I, um, I, I do wholeheartedly agree on that point. Um, if you want to join Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with, uh, with both of you. There's a lot of agreement here. Um, I, you know, I, I also think that it's important to kind of pay attention to the mechanism that is going to produce change. So is it going to be through the, um, through the population, in which case, of course, kind of altering kind of the wages, um, inflation, um, the declining growth, um, the problems that they're having on the consumer spending side, you know, to acquire certain goods. If you look uh, year on year, you know, consumer spending on um, non-grocery goods uh, is down significantly because, you know, they, they can't access especially electronics, um, telecom and so forth, um, whereas it's up for grocery goods. And so, you know, if you think that there are going to be protests and that's going to have some kind of influence, then that's very important to track those measures. And as both uh, 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 Dalip and Julia have, have also um, emphasized, if you're looking more at kind of degrading the military capability, then, you know, the export controls are going to be more relevant. Um, and maybe there's more to do also in trying to, you know, kind of get at 
Putin and the uh, oligarchs and the generals, right, so that they also really feel the pain. Um, of course, that's difficult because of evasion and so forth. And I think also to, um, you know, Dilip's um, the point uh, on how we think about uh, sanctions uh, uh, efficacy in terms of, you know, like what are these influence attempts compared to, right, the counterfactual. I think that's so important. And in fact, you know, even in terms of the, um, the, the kind of conclusions about dollar dominance, I mean, I think that it's a very unipolar dollar world. And if you look in a span of two decades, it's been declining, right? And so the question is, like, like the, the ones that are diversifying, right, because there are some countries that are going to um, obviously, the, social, the, the uh, sanctioning coalition is not going to be diversifying away. It's the countries that, um, you know, uh, think that well, maybe they want to be able to do some of the things that are currently being sanctioned. So those are the countries that are um, going to be shying away from the dollar. And um, do they prefer financial sanctions, or would they rather have, you know, the back to the interventionist period, where we're looking at military means in order to achieve some of these foreign policy objectives, right? I mean, that's really the count of counterfactual on that side as well. So not just in terms of the efficacy, but also in terms of the backlash, right? I mean, just, just to close on this topic, in terms of how to judge these sanctions against Russia. We've talked for a while now about ensuring this will be a strategic failure for Putin. And the way I would define that is what is going to be Russia's ability to project influence uh, and power in the world? And I, I would say unequivocally that if you look at that question using a military lens, an economic lens, or a technological lens, Russia will emerge from this invasion considerably weaker and less relevant. No, I think period. Almost everybody would, would agree to that. Um, maybe there is one point uh, which is uh, maybe specifically interesting in, in Europe and, and in Germany. So, in a way, sanctions do backfire, or, or they can do that. So, if we if we impose sanctions on on Russia, that also means, uh, uh, for example, for for Europe or for Germany, that we don't get any more the, the cheap energy. So, uh, this is a discussion here, of course. And uh, I think a lot of Germans uh, would agree that, that it's necessary to, to do something and, and uh, that it costs a lot, but it's worth doing that. But of course, there are political parties, on, I would say, on the, on the very left, on the very right, who want to take profit out of that. Uh, that can be here in, in Germany, that could be also in other countries, that they say, uh, why are we why are we fighting for Ukraine and, and, and sitting in a cold apartment? Well, why are you doing that? And in Germany, even some some very no, well known intellectuals are arguing in the way. Well, it's it's not really so the way that it's only Putin and and so on and so on. So to come to the point, my question is: If you have sanctions, how can you prevent that this is backfiring? on your own friends, on your own country, and so eroding the cohesion, the political cohesion that you need at, at a, as a fundament for, for the sanctions. Uh, maybe, Julia, you, you want to sure. I mean, go I there? Think, I mean, I think, in, as Dilip alluded earlier, the ideal case is that you try to exert as much pressure on, on, on the target of sanctions while minimizing the effect on your domestic economy. Sure. The reality is, is that it's, you know, in, in many cases, that's not possible, right? That, that this is sanctions and, 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 and tools of economic statecraft are not without costs, right? And I think that they, we, we, we tend to think that this is something we can do upon the other, and especially those, you know, the United States with the you know the quote unquote overwhelming privilege of the u s dollar we think that we can sort of outsource pain onto the uh, onto the you know quote unquote adversary without internalizing in any of that ourselves. But I think this comes back to maybe i mean just to take a little bit of a broader look about what what is economic statecraft to begin with right it 's the inter the use of tools we are in where the where national governments right decide that they are going to intervene into the welfare of their own country, into the welfare of private enterprise, for a national security purpose, okay? And we have a panoply of ways we can do this. We talk about financial sanctions the most, I think, because they, um, they're, you know, is the most um, sophisticated use. I think so that, you know, we, we say, we use the term, like, slapping sanctions on, or all kinds of things that is sort of this way of violent <laughs> punishment that, you know, like, aha, we got them now, right? Mm. And then there's export controls, investment screening, uh, 
tariffs, um, all kinds of different interventions and modular use of our, of, of our regulatory systems um, to affect a national security change. And what we do in, in doing so, right, is not only do we, we create a um, sort of a implementation quagmire within governments, because again, this is the, it's a, conf, it's a con, confluence of, you know, of, of intelligence agencies and foreign, um, foreign services, so our State Department, um, of, of, of course, of, of finance ministries, of regulators, right? Everybody has a piece of this. And so how do you actually make, reach, um, reach an actual policy conclusion with in governments that, is, that, 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 that sort of accounts for everybody's equities is one side. The other side is that um, we are ultimately outsourcing the implementation of our national security policy into the private sector. So if, you were, if we were conducting a military operation, we would tell, uh, we would tell our forces where they had to shoot. Um, instead, you know, I mean, and I say this personally, having sat inside, you know, been in different um, different parts of the U.S. government myself, you think you're designing a really um, a really well designed intellectual framework to put pressure on a government without understanding what it means on the other side. And I think my um, colleague Anahita Tolms mentioned this earlier on the trade panel. Um, is that ultimately the sort of soldiers, and I'm, I'm saying this intentionally, provocatively, the soldiers in your, in your financial war are not the people who are necessarily being told what to do. They're the they're private sector, right? Um, and they're banks, and they are industry, um, who don't necessarily understand, um, A, um, what they're supposed to do, why they're supposed to do, and, what, and, and of course are going to chafe at the idea that it's going to affect their bottom line. And so that's, that's also something that I think we have to really think about when we, when we take this, this body of economic statecraft and we say, okay, um, our, our governments are capable of intervening in free market enterprise for their, you know, for their self-defined purposes, but what actually are the downstream effects of that? And of course, in the, in the European sense right now, we're seeing that that trade-off that governments, that, that governments have now made is that, in, that, that large sectors of, the, of, um, of German industry will, will, will experience very high operating costs, and consumers might be affected as well. And so that, you know, I think that there's, there, we have failed in a communication, perhaps, that this is that, the, that these tools are going to be more painful than we had anticipated. Mm. And I'll just add. I mean, I, I'll parrot President Biden and say, "We're going to tell the truth. Defending freedom is never costless." Yeah, there are going when you when you sanction a one and a half trillion dollar economy that has systemic relevance in energy and to some extent food. There are going to be global spillovers. So, job one is try to reduce those spillovers as much as possible. In the U.S., we've released uh, almost 200 million barrels from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. That's about one-third of the total. Uh, we've doubled LNG exports to Europe. Uh, and, and still, we're, we're, we're facing very high energy prices around the world. Uh, more will need to be done. The same goes for food, which is particularly, uh, is particularly harmful and impacting to the developing world. You know, we know 30% of the world's wheat comes out of uh, Odessa. Uh, sunflower oil and uh, fertilizers are also being disrupted in terms of their supply chain impact. And so we need to come together, and we are, as an international community, to surge food production where we can, make sure we're not putting export restrictions uh, where they've been put in place, uh, where we, release, we should release stockpiles if they exist. And uh, the IMF and the World Bank and other MDBs can provide targeted support for countries that are in need. But, but more broadly, I mean, the second point to make is that policy always has trade-offs. And what would be the costs of doing nothing? I'll repeat that question. Sure, sure. <laughs> what would be the uncertainties it would cause, the chilling effect it would create, uh, the signal it would send to dictators and autocrats that you too can now carve out your own sphere of influence? What would be the costs of going down that path? And, and to my mind, those, those costs are unacceptable and much higher than the path we're on. Carla, do you have a comment on this, this thing, the, the backfiring and how you can keep it low on a low level? So, I, I think that there is a question um, <clears throat> that has been uh, raised in, in various fora about, you know, what to do with the, uh, with the non-sanctioning uh, G countries. 
and and um, you know I, <clears throat> I think that this is perhaps where we we might disagree a little bit on on this on this on this panel um, because I, I think that those you know kind of BRICS plus and Argentina just you know gave its formal application to 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 join to join BRICS and um, I think there is a real danger in coming down too hard on these countries because in effect it's not only that they did not sanction Russia they just don't sanction a lot so to ask them to participate in this mega sanctioning enterprise is a lot and they're 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 you know calibrating their opportunities right i mean what they can get from China in particular, but now China looks like it's, well, it's also hedging, but it's kind of more aligned with, with Russia at the moment. Um, and then what it can get um, from the United States in terms of security uh, guarantees. And I think that, you know, the Philippines, uh, you know, recent kind of turnaround is, is a very good testament to this, where, you know, they're openly saying basically, well, we want, you know, more trade with China, but we also want U.S. security guarantees. Hmm. And so I think that it would be a bit unfair and harsh to exclude these countries from the G constellation and just have kind of a minimal G7, right? Um, I mean, whether formally or informally. Um, it, and it would also be a strategic blunder, I think. I think it would be a strategic mistake because that then puts real distance and it doesn't recognize the fact that they're just kind of doing what they always do, which is they don't really use financial sanctions. Maybe I, I don't disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe before, before, you, uh, before you go on, uh, Julia, I'm, I may add uh, a specific thing. So if we had the, when we had the, the Iran sanctions, we had the problem here in Europe that European banks had to obey, obey to the American sanctions, and not to European law. So that all brings, things, brings us to the third party problem. So how can we get a third party to, to agree to our sanctions? And as you said, how far can we go? Uh, how is that to see from maybe even from a legal uh, standpoint and, and from a standpoint if you are in, in uh, both in the NATO, for example? So. Uh, I just wanted to add these, these aspects, but, but I think the, the general question is, uh, what, what can we do about this, the third party? Maybe, maybe mm -hmm. Julia, you yeah, no, but just to, to maybe just to respond quickly to this idea about you know the, the rest of the, the rest of the world that might you know disagree politically with what Russia has done and not signed on to sanctions, you know. Again, these are there are many many calculus I mean cal calculate about how you know what the effects in a domestic economy are. Whether you're going to ask a developing economy to take a hit versus a, a developed economy to do so is obviously going to be a very um, a very different calculus if you're sitting in, in in Washington or in Berlin or if you're sitting somewhere where uh, honestly you just can't afford to put f further pressure on your economies. But then I think it also goes back to this disconnect about whether is a sanction a diplomatic tool or is it a financial freezing mechanism? Because if it's a diplomatic tool, then you're going to want to say, oh, you know, every country in the world has put sanctions on, on Russia, even though on a practical basis they have no ability to freeze assets, even if they knew they were in their jurisdiction, they wouldn't be able to freeze them in the first place. And so then this, this idea of like, you know, creating a map to show like color in all the countries that say no, right, via sanctions is like, well, then sanctions are really just the, a glorified form of a demarche <laughs> versus are they something where you're actually going to physically be able to, um, to freeze an asset? And then it comes back to actually the G7 is really where it has to happen, because that's where a lot of that there's Hmm. where the bulk majority of these assets are ultimately had because of the depth of capital markets, because of, uh, of, ma of many different factors. Um, when, it, um, I mean, I, when it comes to um, secondary sanctions, which I think is what you're, what you're coming at, um, you know, it, um, the, the, the supporters of it would say, we are ultimately prote protecting, the, protecting our national currency, right? If you want to use the U.S. dollar and settle in the U.S. dollar, then you have to comply by the laws of the U.S. dollar, okay? But, um, and that, of course, has a lot, of, um, a lot of impact on who can transact where if the U.S. government does put secondary sanctions restrictions, the U.S. Congress puts secondary sanctions restrictions. 
Um, but for me, you know, when I think about it sort of more theoretically speaking, it really boils down to failed multilateralism, right? Having to compel, um, having to compel a country to to remove all of its transactions and and financial connections to a third jurisdiction against its will is, I think, just it reflects that the that the policy wasn't convincing enough ultimately to the to the to the, to the secondary country that you're trying to convince, and so. As, I mean, that's maybe. I mean, please. I, I mean, I'd love to. I'd like to hear my, my colleagues disagree on that. But when I think about when I think about the um, Iran sanctions and when the Trump administration did leave the JCPOA, right? There was a really sort of ultimately like not like substantive intellectual disagreement on the strategy between the U.S. government at the time and its European partners about how to actually pressure Iran mm -hmm. and how you were actually yeah. were going to solve the nuclear problem. And it, was not, um, and it was not to pull out of the deal. Yeah, it was, of course, different interests. So we have a lot of, of companies here who will make a good business with Iran, smaller companies as well, and mid-sized companies. And, and all of a sudden, they didn't know how to do business because mm -hmm. they didn't know how to, to get paid for that. So maybe you... I mean, I, I, I agree with elements of, of what both yeah. Carla and Julia said. First, I mean, I think the, the G7 has a very strong interest in broadening the coalition mm -hmm. uh, that's implementing sanctions towards the majority of the G20 and, and beyond. Mm -hmm. it, it multiplies the direct impact. It also strengthens the signal, the indirect signal of what the purpose of these sanctions really are. Uh, they're not, they should not be construed as a, a narrow G7 objective. They really are meant to be a global defense of shared principles. Uh, I agree with Julia, too, that, that look, uh, the, first, the first line of effort in trying to broaden a coalition is quiet, private diplomacy. And the truth is, we have a lot of deal space with countries that have been um, hedging their bets and that have been on the, on the fence. Many countries have long-standing defense relationships with Russia or may have energy uh, relationships that have been uh, quite valuable. Well, we should work with those countries to provide a reliable alternative, and we are doing that. India, for example? Or? That's an example. Okay. Uh, and, and I think secondary sanctions, that's a tool that should be used as a last resort if there's blatant, overt efforts to undermine the efficacy of sanctions. Uh, and, and so that's, that's really, I think, uh, I think, as Julia put it, that's, that's what happens when multilateralism has failed. Uh, but there are many options short of that. And, uh, you know, I think that's where you're going to see the sanctions regime pr proceed. Okay. Um, I have one question, I'm sure. Maybe, maybe I just you, you continue. I'm, I'm sure you, you would ask again, uh, what is the alternative? But uh, I think we should uh, touch it briefly, at least. And that's the ethical question. So the sanctions very often uh, are targeted at the population because uh, it's not possible the other way. Of course, if, if it's targeted at, at technology, at military te technology, that's not the case. But uh, I remember that we had a, a lot of discussions, uh, I think, about the sanctions against Iraq between the, the two wars, um, uh, because they, uh, they, as I read, had done a lot of damage to, to the population there, there in Iraq. So I think we, we, should, uh, we shouldn't leave out that question. Uh, is, how far is it, is it in order? Is it okay? to have sanctions that target in a very harmful way the population and, and not, not the military? Well, I, I would start by asking what are the ethics of doing nothing? And we've, we've spoken about that already. Um, with respect to the ethics of sanctions, however, you know, they typically are not targeting the civilian population. They're absolutely not targeting the civilian population in Russia. They're targeting the commanding heights of the Russian economy, which of course has consequences on the civilian population. There's no way around that. We're talking about major economic distortions. And when you have major economic distortions, that's going to affect uh, the, the, the activity in the economy, the level of inflation, and, and the standard of living. Maybe I was but, wrong to say targeted. So what, what I meant is, that they have 
that they have uh, consequences. They have consequences. So, so that's that's that, a fact. Yeah, so that that was wrong to say targeted. Yeah. No, no yeah. problem. Yeah. No problem. But but again, uh, you know, we we always have the ability to de-escalate sanctions. Uh, Putin can never bring back the lives that have been lost. You see, sure. so that's the difference. Sure. Uh, what what are the ethics of allowing a, a brutal, rapacious invasion to continue unchecked? versus taking forceful measures uh, that, that increase the costs for continuing the invasion mm -hmm. and for allowing other dictators and autocrats uh, to also see that they might get a free pass if they did the same. That's the question. Carla? Yeah, I, you know, I, so I, I recognize, I do think that there is an ethical dilemma and that you know, sometimes the, the civilian population is kind of collateral damage and it's an unintended consequence um, but, you know, I also agree that it really depends on um, what the government is doing. So, you know, sometimes when we talk about these normative concerns, it's like, you know, the, the government is God's best child. And, and, and that's not the case, right? So, it, you know, if, if there are human rights abuses, then that is also causing um, a, a civilian suffering. Sure. Um, you know, if there's a problem with widespread uh, corruption and, you know, stolen elections, then that's also inflicting, you know, usually um, economic harms and, um, you know, uh, civil rights harms on, on the population, not to speak of, you know, torture and uh, ancillary harms. So, I, you know, I think that, again, you know, we need to kind of contrast and compare then the, 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 the normative concerns uh, that are being alleviated as opposed to letting the situation continue. And then I think that there is this question of, you know, what kind of, you know, we, th we care a lot about sovereignty and in international relations. And so there is this sense that any harm inflicted from abroad by a foreign power is is greater than what the the ruler, the domestic sure, ruler, sure. has a right sure. to. Sure. But I don't necessarily think that that's a very fruitful way of then you know scaling the ethical dimension. Mm -hmm. Julia, some remarks on that? No, no. I mean, I, I I completely agree, and I think that although I mean we have carve outs for humanitarian exemptions, right? There, I mean, the ultimate collateral damage does ultimately lie with the populations, right? And mm. we do. I mean, again, try to calibrate these things to minimize those damages. But again, just as it's going to have that, 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 that these measures are going to have impacts on our own domestic economies, they're going to have unintended consequences on the targets as well. And so they, these are, these are um, absolutely imperfect tools. Um, and I know that there are, there are various policy options to try to counter that, whether this is a complex licensing structure, whether it's actually deliveries of humanitarian goods, whether it's exceptions, whether it's barter deals. There are all kinds of cute ways that we have tried to counteract the humanitarian impact. It is there, right? But, um, but again, again, to be provocative, so, so is military conflict, right? You, you want to change a behavior of, of an international actor, you're going to do something about it, right? Sure, and, you're, sure. and you're going to have to absorb the costs. Sure. Yeah. Maybe we come back to, to, to the, the beginning of, of our conversation, so about currency and power. And so what does it mean for, for the United States uh, with, a, with a great currency? And, and uh, we have discussed about that. And uh, I'm, I'm, I, think I'm, I think there is no, no, not a real big threat right now for, for the dollar to, to stay on the, on, the first, uh, on the first place. But... Uh, if, if the dollar is used as, uh, as a kind of weapon or so, and if that is done maybe too often or whatever or not targeted enough, is there a danger that this will erode the, the role of the dollar and, and, the, the, uh, and that, to that degree also the role of the United States? What, what, what do you think about that? Maybe, maybe we start with you, Carla. Well, you know, it's, so I, you know, I think, and I, you know, it's clearly demonstrated in the paper also that it's a very unipolar dollar um, world, and it is not going away anytime soon. I mean, for the long foreseeable future, because, you know, the gap between the United States and the nearest competitor, which happens to be an ally, you know, the most important allies uh, of the United States, um, they, it's, just too, too, it's just too large even there. And so, 
you know, to China, like China is on the floor and the United States is way up. And so, um, so there's no immediate threat, but I still do think that the, you know, the, these changes do take time. And I think that we're seeing, you know, a fundamental kind of transformation in the underlying patterns that, ha that we, you know, that we have not seen before, in addition to technological changes. And so I think that it is something that needs to be, to be monitored. And to your second question, because there were two questions baked into this, and I do think that, yes, you know, having the dollar for the United States is of, you know, great benefit. There are costs as well, but I do believe that the, the benefits uh, far outweigh uh, those costs. Yeah. Dalip, for, in a way, we're talking about are we <clears throat> slip, are we getting into a different world order, or is, are we on a slippery, uh, on a slippery path maybe to, to come to a different world or a different form what, what we have now? I think that that would be um, connected to, 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 to what, what you uh, told us. So uh, how, how big is this risk, in, in your opinion? I mean, so first the facts, there's no, on paper, there's nothing to see here. Yeah. Uh, it's true that as a share of total global reserves, the dollar has fallen about 10 percentage points this century, mostly, uh, mostly as a rotation to higher yielding currencies, but as a, as a form of payment or as a source of money to borrow money, the dollar is either stable or it's increased its share. And ironically, we're having this conversation in a year in which the dollar has appreciated more than any other year in the past half a century, except 1997 and 2018, both of which ended in tears. But that aside, <laughs> there's nothing to see here on paper. That doesn't mean we shouldn't worry about this mm. constantly, and, and, we, and we do. You can't just rely on network effects or dollar primacy by default because there's not a viable alternative. Um, I think we've got to we've got to spend a lot of time uh, considering a doctrine of economic statecraft. We've spent hundreds of years doing that for military doctrine. It's time for us to do that with economic statecraft. Mm -hmm. When do we use these very potent tools? Not just sanctions, but export controls, investment screening, entity listings, uh, the entire the entire gamut of, of so-called negative coercive devices. We should have an analytical infrastructure that allows us to put those, those principles, those guiding principles of a doctrine into practice. So what are the tools? What's the efficacy of using these tools in isolation or in tandem, unilaterally, multilaterally? What are the limitations of those tools? What are the spillovers? Uh, when have they been used well in history? When have they been used poorly? The, the Fed and central banks do this very well with their toolkit. Mm -hmm. So should government authorities. Uh, we need personnel that uh, are sophisticated, not just on economics and finance, but also geopolitics, international law, and domestic law uh, in order to put those, uh -huh. put those into practice. And, you know, the last thing is we need to balance the use of sanctions with uh, positive inducements. I mentioned some of them before. You know, the world knows a lot about financial sanctions. It doesn't know as much about uh, the amount of bilateral aid that we provide or debt relief or infrastructure finance. Uh, we, have to, we have to win the hearts and minds of countries that have been opposed to sanctions and other forms of, of U.S. economic statecraft uh, by showing them there are actually a lot, of, a lot of ways in which we're using the dollar status and our standing in the world economy for mutual economic good. That, that's how we'll create a, a different narrative and that's how we'll maintain um, leadership in the global economy. Thank you. Julia, maybe... Yeah, I think Before we get to the, to, the, uh, sure. to the floor, you have some, some... I think that there's a distinction that we have to make between, again, between financial sanctions and, um, and intervention in, interventions in trade, right? Because if you think that, um, you know, I agree with what both Dilip and Carl have said about, you know, the, 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 the lack of any sort of near-term threat to U.S. dollar dominance, that doesn't mean that there isn't a near-term threat to uh, Western economic welfare through, um, through trade security. So the more that you use um, tariffs, export controls, again, any sorts of bans, bans on physical things or interventions into supply chains, right? You are undermining the, um, the, the sort of uh, perfect trade model that you learned in graduate school mm. about supply and demand and economic efficiencies mm. and economies of scale, mm. okay? 
So even if you have, even if we say, yeah, okay, we, we, we know that we're going to settle, we're going to settle trade in dollars and countries are going to continue to hold reserves in dollars and they're going to want to clear in U.S. dollars through New York, that doesn't mean that um, we have, we, we can compensate for losses that we might incur upon ourselves because we have created, created mass distortions in global markets, right? Because I think what we, you know, what we've seen in the course of this of this crisis, right, with Russia, and we had, we haven't even really talked about China today, which is you know the the, the other the, the the overbearing elephant in the room, is that you you create, and this is why I sort of take a little bit of issue with great power competition con con concept, is because you are empowering other parts of the world through the through the comparative advantage that they have now come into. Right, whether it's the Gulf with energy resources, whether it's India saying, "Well, now everyone has to come to us. We're the largest democracy in the world." But I guess I guess we have a lot of brokering power mm -hmm. to um, to whether China is or is not going to issue um, mm -hmm. some sort of financial uh, financial assistance uh, assistance to Russia. This is, you know, what what is Bolsonaro going to do with grain markets? Again, again, it creates. A different uh, different incentives for global actors, and that's in trade. Right, and I think that that is some of what um, the, the what we're been playing around with the most. Certainly, the Trump administration played around with it a lot. The Biden administration hasn't pulled back from a lot of those concepts as well. So I think that that um, that is where, where I think the rubber is going to hit the road right now in terms of how we design our regulatory um, our regulatory framework and how we actually are going to in economically interact with China and what lines uh, what lines in the sand we're going to draw and what distortions that then oh. creates right so Ru russia is sort of a test case for that and oh, so that's interesting yeah <laughs> the distinction between financial and trade okay thank you very much i think we we should ask i i see here a question Yeah, My name is Thomas von Lübke. I just wanted to ask you, Carla, whether you see any uh, uh, chance uh, to or that a uh, court is organized with the support of the European Union, the US, as well as India and uh, China to uh, uh, talk about and to rule about uh, the uh, uh, central bank money that has been frozen because in order for the right uh, incentives, I think it would be best to have a Sally sitting in one account in Russia's name and another one in the Ukrainian name, and for each rocket uh, having money uh, being transmitted with the order of the court, so that we have a multilateral answer, which would be economic statecraft, but multilaterally. Um, okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure. Um, so, um, I'm, I'm sorry, can, can you... Um uh, there were some aspects of your question that I, that I did not actually understand because I think that there were some German terms and I don't speak, speak any, any German. Can you clarify your question? I'll try to. I'll try to speak English. Okay. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> as long as you don't ask, ask me to translate it into French, we should be able to do it. The idea was uh, whether there is a multilateral mm -hmm. uh, angle or an opportunity to uh, get economic uh, statecraft, economic sanctions uh, organized through a court hearing, including the made mm -hmm. court hearing. a court. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, not, okay, from our German point of view, it could be the international court in Den Haag. But so far, I don't know how much recognition it has by the US, uh, China, and India. But uh, if, it, if it is based on a United Nations institution, mm -hmm. we would not have the uh, uh, problems discussed this morning, that this is immediately uh, uh, f causing retaliation by the Chinese or actions, reactions by the Chinese, which we want to avoid. Um, okay, so, um, uh, you know, I, I think that the, uh, um, a multilateral uh, kind of approach to sanctions is is usually more successful, and I think that China has actually signed up to some of those um, sanctions, but it is um, reluctant to otherwise impose financial sanctions at all. Does that answer your question, or...? To a quarter. <laughs> okay, to a quarter. No, so, uh, sorry to uh, 
rephrase it. Uh, my question was, uh, of course, it's important to bring China to the table. Mm -hmm. I think we agree on that one. Mm -hmm. My point was uh, whether the, uh, you or one of your uh, other uh, colleagues on the panel sees a chance that we uh, uh, convince at least the two main abstaining nations in the United Nations Assembly uh, to join us in the discussion how, uh, how to deal with the frozen money. Because mm -hmm. I think it is very clear that this frozen money should not be just released and given back. But on the other side, I see the argument made by Maria this uh, morning that uh, it is dangerous just to seize it unilaterally. And that's why the idea was whether there is a chance to organize a court hearing in order to uh, uh, get this decided. Because uh, if we don't do it on a multilateral basis, I think it is highly unlikely that Russia will concede to uh, uh, pay uh, after the war. That's why I think it's important to get at least the international pressure, the multilateral pressure, enacted. So, so you, you're looking for a legal way to unfreeze things, maybe you Sure. Two thoughts. One is Ukraine's going to need hundreds of billions of dollars to reconstruct its country after this invasion, after this war concludes. Some of that money, much of it has already come from bilateral official donations. Another portion will come from multilateral institutions. Another, uh, another chunk will come from the private sector, uh, both in terms of restructuring debt, but also new contributions. But Russia should pay its share, and it should be a very large share. So we have two pots of money to consider, the central bank assets and the oligarch assets. I think they have very different implications in terms of seizing and transferring the proceeds. When it comes to the oligarchs, you know, each country has a different legal process. I am far from a lawyer. Uh, but to the extent that some of these oligarchs have committed crimes, my understanding is there is a legal basis in at least some countries to take title to the assets, to liquidate them, and to ultimately transfer those proceeds. When it comes to central bank assets, I think we're talking about something that's qualitatively different. And here we would absolutely need to make a decision together, all the major central banks of the world, uh, because the implications are uh, generational, multi-generational. Once countries no longer feel as though their assets are safe in the custody of the New York Fed or any other central bank, um, there could be ripple effects for which the unintended consequences are severe. And so I think of those two pots of money as being very different, but in either case, we need to find a way for Russia to fill a, a substantial portion of the hole it's created. Thank you. I think the next question was over there. Uh, thanks. Uh, Dan Tannebaum, we've talked a lot about imposing sanctions. We haven't talked about enforcing sanctions. And uh, sanctions have historically been apolitical uh, for a long time. But the enforcement has dropped substantially over the past few years. You can impose new sanctions as a form of compelling people to fall in line with the multilateral agenda. But this is to Julian DeLeap. What role do you think enforcement should play for actually punishing firms that are subject to those sanctions, not just in the U.S., but across the EU and, and other allies, for these violations as another mechanism of driving the agenda to further isolate countries like Russia? Julia? Sure. I mean, it's a... Dana, there are two sides to enforcement. One is sort of benevolent enforcement when, you know, the long term when, when, when firms do what governments ask them to do. And the second is when, of course, where there's judicial action uh, for, for, having, for not having upheld that. Um, you know, I think that, you know, back to sort of what I was saying before about like slapping sanctions is, is if that's the action and then it's done, right? The, the meat on the bones comes through the course of years about enforcing them, right? To make sure that there aren't leaks in the system. Um, to um, to understanding where again, if, especially if you're talking, if you're trailing assets or oligarch assets, is actually going down, you know, following the breadcrumbs and actually figuring where the, out where these assets are, and then going through a tedious process of trying to freeze them wherever wherever they may be, and that's actually the important part all about this, and it is incredibly difficult to do, right? Um, the international financial system, in all of its glory, is very well designed for sanctions evasion. Um, and if, if you want to launder money, there's someone who will tell you how to do it really well, and it will probably, and it may very well be out of the 
a reach of um, of, a, of any author of an official authority or a bank that's trying to look for it. And so that is again that is the long term burn on making sure that these things are effective on the sort of a compliance side. Um, on um, I do think that there are. Um, there is a lot of there is value to occasionally posing a large deterring fine um, um, on an, on a financial institution or a firm that has a sort of um, wittingly um, evaded sanctions and gone uh, and gone to great lengths to um, to obfuscate the source of funds in order to complete a transaction or a deal that is counter to the government it, it domiciles right. Um, although I, but I do think it also, um, on the other side, does harbor resentment, um, especially when you know when when the U.S. government does it. You know, countries think we're doing this not because um, we sign on to the ideology of it or to comply with it, but just because those um, you know those 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 angry Americans or angry whomever are going to come after us if we do it otherwise. And I think that sometimes overmines the sort of beneficent, sort of benevolent will to, to comply with sanctions, even if it's on a country like uh, a country like Russia. I think we have to come to an end now. It looks, looks to me like that. Or we can go. Oh. Okay. Okay. If it's, if it's allowed. So uh, I think over there, Thank you. Uh, I'm Maya Nicoladze, and I want to ask a question about China or the elephant in the room, as Julia mentioned earlier. So in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we saw sudden escalation of sanctions against Russia, and I'm wondering if such sudden escalation of sanctions could happen against China, and what would be the consequences of doing so? Maybe Carla, you want? Yeah, that's, that's a... A difficult question. Um, I, you know, the uh, uh, the situation with China is quite different uh, from uh, you know the the, the Russian situation. Uh, uh, China is a great power on a different scale. Um, there's more dependence uh, with China. Um, uh, China, uh, the, the United States has you know uh, interest in Asia, just as it has in. In, um, in in Europe, um, there's a military dimension also in play with with China um, that could be a, a very very dangerous. But I think economically, just the con the countries are, and you know China is so plugged into the global economy um, that sanctioning China certainly on a scale that we have seen with Russia. Would would have quite catastrophic uh, implications, and I and I and I think that the I mean we'll hear here from uh, you know a, a former uh, U.S. government um, representative, but but I think that you know from my reading of you know what uh, g government officials have been saying, you know they really think twice about you know like in that in that more symmetrical situation to, to try to sanction you know to Sanction China uh, in the same way as, as Russia, I think, is, 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 is a no-go. Yeah. Are there different opinions here on the panel on that? I mean, I, there, there are a million hypotheticals, um, and I don't want to... I'm, I'm not a U.S. government official, but I still I don't want to make any, make any threats. Um, but there's no country that's too big to sanction, in my view. Every country has pressure points. Every country has uh, asymmetries. Um, we have our own, we, the U.S. has its own vulnerabilities, and you can be sure that in the wake of the invasion of Ukraine and the sanctions against Russia, that China's looking very hard at its vulnerabilities and where it has asymmetric advantage or disadvantage. The U.S. is doing the same, uh, and I'm sure active planning is taking place on both sides. I would just say that, you know, I was, I was referring to the kind of central bank, you know, freeze, right? I mean, so that would just have very different uh, repercussions um, if it were China with its, you know, multi-trillion uh, reserves. It's not the same situation as with half a trillion uh, dollars worth of re reserves. Um, 
there might, there might be other sanctions, but financial sanctions on that scale. And again, I don't think that this is some, something that, you know, the U.S. government is going to say because, of course, there needs to be some ambiguity about, you know, what would happen if China crossed certain red lines. Speaking of vulnerabilities, uh, that's something, something we are now finding out. We have a lot of them in Germany as well. <laughs> we didn't know before, maybe. Uh, other questions? Uh, I think over there, over there, behind, yeah. Hi, uh, Charles H. Hill again. Um, I have a question about the price caps on uh, Russian oil. Uh, it was just announced now, it seems I asked questions about uh, breaking news, uh, that the European Union is on board and uh, is trying just to... Announced. Just announced. Just now. Um, but my question, I mean, it, it is mainly for you, Dilip, but it can be for the whole panel as well. You mentioned um, the fact that there were technocrats who are ready to process the sanctions, but perhaps they didn't have the appropriate geopolitical awareness. Um, the criticism of the price cap from not necessarily the Atlantic Council, but others, is that um, the geopolitical call for it, the, the abstract reasons are, are entirely justified. Uh, the technical way you would apply it isn't necessarily that thought through. So for those who don't know, the price cap is supposed to use insurance markets and insurance providers would have to require, request some sort of attestation from buyers of Russian oil in India, China, wherever, that they have complied with the price cap. Some say this isn't workable. What do you say? Julia? I think that there is going to be a rocky road in trying to figure out how to implement it and how to, how to I mean, again, how to prove it. I ultimately think that it's the best shot that um, Western governments have to uh, minimize the effect on global markets, minimize the effect on themselves, while maintaining the, uh, a modicum of pressure on Russia where it hurts and where it matters. And so, again, going back to imperfect concepts, <laughs> right? This is something that has never been really tried on this scale before like many of the other things that, that have been uh, undertaken over the, course of this, uh, over the course of this crisis. But again, as there are many critics towards the implementation, uh, implementation of the price caps and, and, when, and, where the, and where the gaps might be, but ultimately, I think it's worth, it's, it's worth the shot. Yeah. One more question I see. I think there was somebody over there. Not? I think to oh, sorry. I, I'm, yeah, happy sorry. To, I'm happy to answer yeah, let's the look. question, too, if, if that's okay. <coughs> sure. I mean, okay, okay, okay. I'll, I'll try to be... There's, sorry. there's sorry. so much... No, 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 sorry. no, that's okay. That's okay. I'll try to be I'll quick, because I know there's another question. I mean, the price cap... I'm a fan of price caps. It, it lives in the land of lousy options, right? Because what we're trying to do are three things at once. <laughs> we're trying to minimize the revenues that Putin gets from energy exports. We're trying to maintain the global supply of energy, and we're trying to accelerate our transition to renewable and reliable sources. That's really hard to do. But relative to an option of an outright embargo on Russian energy imports, uh, which all of which will not be displaced to India, Turkey, Korea, elsewhere, um, you know, I think the price cap is a better risk reward for the G7 plus to pursue. Let's remember, oil markets are not competitive. They're run by a seller's cartel. The logic here is why not create bargaining power among buyers uh, and, and reduce the price to, let's say, the pre-invasion level of Brent. I mean, I'm, I'm making that up. The, the level of the price cap is one of the many administrative complexities here. But I think this is a, an, an example of an idea in which the economics and the geopolitics converge. And I have no criticism of technocrats who've been pursuing the price cap. I was one of them. Thank you. Now the last question. Thank you very much. My name is Christian Frank. Um, I wanted to ask a question about an aspect that you alluded to earlier, the sort of analytical infrastructure um, uh, for, for this type of thing. It seems to me that economic statecraft should have sort of a carrot and a stick component. And we've been mostly talking about the stick component right now. Um, so, um, and it also seems to me that sort of, you know, in the 20th century and, you know, the last decades, the biggest carrot around was sort of the U.S., trade deficit ultimately exports into the huge economy. Um, and, you know, it, and at the same time, uh, you know, the, the sort of the, the, the appetite for 
um, you know, that seems to be going more towards reducing that deficit. So, so I wonder, you know, how do you think about the carrot side of the equation? Like, what what is there, you know, in sort of terms of options to to bring people in the G7 and the G20 more on board um, um, with with a sort of stick? Who wants to pick up? Thank you. Sure. Well, I'll, I think this is the last um, the last thing we, we're going to wrap up, so we can <coughs> uh, Commissioner Gentiloni in a second. But I think I think that all of us have been talking about that, for the, or at least I, my, my colleagues have. I've been a little bit more bullish, probably. But that, that there are. I mean, again, we talk about um, economic statecraft off, often in, a, in the punitive sense, right? And even it's something mm. that I that I said earlier, it's like the 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 restriction of commercial activity, right? The imposition of limitations. But again, the, the flip side of that is um, is development aid, right? Is market access, is the um, actual opening of Cleet has given me a thumbs up for market access. I, I agree, right? <laughs> um, and so the the, the 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 idea that you can then offer increased economic <laughs> economic access and opportunity as the positive incentive. Now, I'm not sure whether you know you can whether the, whether there's like whether, whether there's a complete yin and yang on that. Um, but I, but I do think that it is it has been underserved in, um, in in the functioning of our governments, and it's been underserved in the rhetoric in which we talk about how we handle international crises. Can I just can I just sure. jump in on this? Um, it's actually my passion when I was in government was trying to help construct a positive alternative to the Belt Road Initiative. As an example, it really goes to your question because for a long time we've criticized the Belt Road Initiative, we, the U.S., and others, as being uh, extractive and opaque and coercive. But we haven't really offered much of an alternative. You know, another source of financing that's transparent, that doesn't have confiscatory collateral terms, that doesn't have NDAs, uh, and that offers a sustainable source of financing in areas like climate and digital and gender and health. Uh, that's that's where we should be focusing more of our statecraft efforts. We spend a lot of time on sanctions and export controls, and we should because they have very powerful effects. But we're missing a big part of how the West can do good for the world and win hearts and minds if we ignore what developing countries actually need. Okay, that was very interesting. I think maybe beginning with you, starting with you, one last word, just wrapping up a little bit from, from your perspective? Sure. I mean, so, um, so I think I, I agree that we need a, um, we do need a sort of doctrine of economic statecraft. I agree with you in that. And I think it's something that we've been working at. I mean, I worked at when I was on the Atlantic Council as well, but it doesn't, the, it, it, it's very hard to define, right? Defining the terms of engagement and what counts is very, very difficult. And I think what it comes down to is that it is a challenge, um, a challenge for governments uh, and the private sector to actually wrap their heads around how these mechanisms work together, right? And so I think if we are, if we are determining the balance of power and the relationship between na between countries in, in in much more amorphous terms than we have in the past, then we actually need to rethinking about how our governments are structured in order to do that, how our national security apparatus is structured, um, and how these decisions are made. Um, that's I mean, that's just my, um, my personal observation. I particularly think that it is, that is a particularly prescient point for Germany, <laughs> where, the, where, where, of course, there's a larger, broader discussion on a National Security Council, how do you communicate within and, and cooperate within coalition governments. And this idea of how you balance um, things that you do for economic welfare and for competition and what you do in the, in the pure national security interest. Again, it is a, a challenge of organizational design. Okay, thank you. Carla? Um, yes, and so I think that just um, very briefly walking backwards from the very last question, I think it's a great point. This, you know, and we're kind of pitting uh, coercion versus inducement and, you know, I think that very much the strategy on the part of, of China is to use economic inducement as a way of attracting... Oh, yeah. um, the Silk countries. Road. Right. Sorry? The Silk Road. Yeah, the Silk Road. Yeah, um, you know, but also more immediate kind of bilateral okay. um, mm -hmm. initiatives. And so there is this danger that that there's, you know, one side, and in particular the United States, that is viewed as very coercive, and that China is offering these tangible benefits. And if caught between these two options, um, you know, there, there will be also be more diversification 
away from the Western-oriented system. And so I think that's a, um, um, a, a big uh, um, kind of danger. I think that also in terms of the backlash, I think that I would like to kind of like modify, you know, the way that, you know, perhaps some of the initial points that I made came across because, you know, I also want to emphasize that while, while some countries are diversifying away from, you know, the, the, the United States in particular, I mean, the Eurozone, um, there's large support as well, right, um, for what the United States um, and, the, and the coalition as, ho as a whole um, has done. And so there's, you know, we also see uh, countries who agree with this vision of international order actually kind of doubling down into this system, right? So there's a stabilizing mechanism as well that is very, um, th that is very prevalent. And I think we kind of lose sight of that when, when we're continuously talking about this backlash against the United States in particular, but also, um, you know, the broader coalition and what the costs are going to be uh, because of this Russian initiative. So I'll end on that now. I'll, I'll quote Spider-Man and say, uh, uh, <laughs> with, with great economic powers comes the need for sound principles, rigorous analysis, and a balance between economic harm and economic good. Well, thank you very much. I learned a lot. I got a lot of, I think we all got a lot of answers, and we got one very important question. What is the alternative? What else should we do? So I think it's important to, to ask over and over again that, that, uh, that question. Uh, thank you very much.